Okay, good morning everybody. Let's uh, get started. Welcome to CS228. Uh, for how many of you is this your first class of the semester? My hands up, this is the first class for me, so I apologize. It's going to take me a little bit to still shift mental gears from the summer to class. So um, I'm Josh Bonger. Josh is fine. Obviously, we're here Tuesday and Thursday mornings uh, in Rowell. Uh, I realize this might be a little bit early for some of you. Uh, I apologize for that. I will do my best to make it uh, worth your while. Um, so I hold office hours over in Farrell Hall, which is on the Trinity campus. You can come find me there Wednesdays and Thursdays, uh, 110 or 115. And the teaching assistant for this course is Jack Houck. Jack, do you want to raise your hand there? And Jack is going to have office hours uh, on Wednesdays as well and Fridays. Uh, Jack will also be over in the Farrell building. If you come on over and come up to the second floor, there's an open space on the second floor with desks and you should be able to find Jack there uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do this morning is mostly logistics, um, how this course is run, um, expectations that Jack and I will have for you guys, and the expectations that you can have uh, for us, and time permitting, we'll actually get into some of the meat uh, of the course. Speaking of time, we're going to finish uh, about 15 minutes early today, which will give you time to sign out one of the Leap Motion devices. So the whole structure of this course is built around this little guy here. Um, so you'll be signing one of these out uh, at the end of the course, and we do this like a rental car agency. So you're going to grab a Leap Motion device, take it home, sign it out, and then at the end of the course, uh, you'll check it back in, and hopefully there's not too many bumps and scratches uh, on it at that time. Okay, while we're on the subject of Leap Motion, um, this course, many aspects of this course are going to probably look very different to you from a traditional computer science course. It's a bit of a mixture of computer science and psychology, and we're going to use the Leap Motion device as sort of a tool to ground a lot of the concepts we touch on uh, in this course. So when you get your Leap Motion device um, and you try it out at home, the first thing you'll be able to do is install the software and then run uh, the visualizer demo. So um, I'm going to try and do this here for you. Um, this is the Leap Motion device and inside it are two infrared cameras. And if I turn on the camera, you'll actually see the images from the two cameras and then superimposed on top of that is this 3D representation of my hand. So the software inside of the Leap Motion device, what is it doing? It's capturing the pixel values that are coming from the two cameras and then running some machine learning algorithm that takes as input the, those pixel values and infers the X, Y, and Z position of all the major bones in your hand and it does it more or less in real time. The Leap Motion device can detect when there is no hand over the device, when there is, let it recalibrate here, when there is one hand over the device, and let's see, there we go, two hands over the device. And you'll notice immediately that the Leap Motion device is not perfect. Let's take away one hand, make things easier on the device. If I close my hand into a fist, it'll eventually figure that out. Thumb, index finger, both, three, there we go, three, four, not bad. You'll notice it's having a little bit of a problem when I close my fist. Why? That's a bunch of things on top of one another. A bunch of things on top of one another, right? So it can't literally at the moment see the distal phalanges or the tips of these fingers, right? So already there's something that's kind of outside of computer science. We're somewhere in the realm of engineering, computer vision, computer science, machine learning, uh, and understanding something about the human hand. There are some other things that make recognizing the X, Y, and Z positions in the bones of the hand difficult for this device. Aside from whether my hand is open or closed, what might those things be? For those of you that were here a few years ago and you took CS50, I asked you the same question, but it's been a few years. What else makes things diffi difficult? Just the temperature of the air. Like it was really cold and your hands are colder. Maybe it's a harder time to 
Yep, that's right. So that can affect temperature can affect uh, this device, especially when we get to November and December. Different people have different sized hands. You will notice if you have a friend in this class, for one of you, it might work well and the other not so well. So this device has inbuilt a bias already. It's better at recognizing some hands than others for various reasons. We're gonna talk about bias in this course. It's a very hot topic in AI uh, at the moment and has a lot to do with, with HCI as well. What else makes recognizing the human hand difficult? Not everybody has five fingers, absolutely. I use this hand other than this hand, and I'm a righty. That's one thing. What else is different between these two hands? One has a ring on it, uh, and the other doesn't. This ring happens to be somewhat reflective, which makes things very difficult for an infrared camera. Uh, so for those of you with lots of rings, that might also be an issue. So in order to understand the leap motion device and program code for the leap motion device, which you're gonna be doing in this class, you have to think not just about the device and the machine learning algorithm and the cameras, you have to think about the people that are interacting with the device. And that's, if you take one thing away from this course, that's what I want you to take away from this course. Those who go on and get a job in industry and are developing interface software or interface hardware that are basically doing HCI in industry, the ones that succeed are the ones that are able to think carefully about not just the tech, but the people that are going to use it. So before Leap Motion was invented, it would be interesting to know whether the people, or the people that actually created Leap Motion sort of thought about that sort of thing. Most people in this classroom are probably right-handed rather than left-handed. If you ask someone to put their hand over this device, they will subconsciously usually put their dominant hand over the device. Does that matter? Maybe yes, maybe no. Depends on what they're gonna be doing with the Leap Motion device. Did they think about the fact that some people have rings, that some people don't all have five fingers? Um, some people suffer various motor impairments, so they can't necessarily hold their hand still, which also makes things challenging for the Leap Motion device. Getting this to work well and getting your project to work well when you're using the sleep motion device, you're going to have to think very carefully about the people that are using it. Okay, so that's uh, leap motion. We'll come back to that several times uh, today and throughout uh, the course. As I mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about logistics today. Um, so all of the material for the course, more or less, you can get to it uh, from Blackboard. Just to orient you a little bit here, I will put up announcements from time to time. I won't, I'll won't. i try not to use email, so if you're not clear about what's going on in the course, come to Blackboard, check out the recent announcements, and you'll notice that uh, over here I've linked to a PDF, which is the syllabus for the course, and we're just going to very quickly go through the syllabus so that we're all literally and metaphorically on the same page. Okay, um, you'll notice that in the uh, syllabus, there's a link to the schedule. We'll talk about the schedule in a moment. Here's the little blurb uh, for the course, design implementation and evaluation of user interfaces. So we're really focusing uh, in this course on the front end of software and hardware uh, together rather than the back end. So there's sort of a complementary course for HCI, which is software engineering, and the software engineering course tends to focus on scaling up or building very large code, usually for the back ends of things. And then those concepts can be applied to building the interface, but the additional thing we need to keep in mind in HCI is the fact that we're dealing with people. That's what sort of separates this from a traditional software engineering uh, course. Okay, uh, topics covered will include interface design. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about design, human factors, cognitive psychology. What do we actually need to know about people, either than the fact that some of us have rings on our finger, in order to design software and hardware well for people to interact with it. We're gonna talk a little bit about robotics, wearable technologies. We're gonna focus on some concepts, but also emerging technologies where the interface between the tech and people is sort of interesting, rich, complex, and therefore also fraught with danger if we don't do it well. The course includes a significant project, and we'll come back and talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, this is a device-free zone, at least from this part of the course forward. Um, that may be somewhat uncomfortable for some of you. 
There is emerging uh, evidence in the literature that says you will take more away from this course uh, if you are taking notes by hand than you are on a computer. If you're interested in that literature, there's a few uh, articles there uh, about it. Okay, so objectives. This is what I hope you're able to take away from this course. So if you complete this course, you should understand something about how to go about designing software and technology so that people will want to use it and it will work well for a broad range uh, of people. Understand the challenges and implications of putting the human first in interface design, what makes things so difficult about thinking about who is going to be using this technology. You're going to be doing a lot of coding with Leap Motion, so you'll get some practical experience with designing and creating interactive systems. In the first 10 weeks of this course, you're going to be doing a series of programming projects. So you're going to be implementing some code that we have in mind for you. And then the last three or four weeks of the semester, you'll have a chance to take that code base and build a system on top of it of your own design. Um, hopefully you'll gain an appreciation for the likely future of continuous and ubiquitous human-machine uh, interaction. So continuous in that most of us today have at least one device on our person that's on at all times. For most of us, that's, that's a cell phone. You might have other devices. So despite the fact that I've outlawed having any of them on your desk, they're still here in the room, and they're probably doing some useful work for you as we speak. So they're continuous, and they're ubiquitous. Human-computer interaction or interactive technology, we are in the process as a society of embedding technology in all aspects of our indoor and outdoor life, for better, for worse. And that raises interesting design challenges and opportunities for those that know something about uh, HCI. Okay, so let's talk about course materials. Uh, as you probably already figured out, there's no required textbook for the course. Um, there will be assigned reading for each uh, lecture day, and that's all available from the schedule, which we'll look at in a moment. As, no questions? Uh, much of the reading will be drawn, uh, mo much of the reading excerpts will be drawn from this book, so if you are interested in this book, um, you can grab a copy from the library. I haven't done it yet, but I will put a copy of this book on loan uh, in the library if you're interested. There will be a few excerpts from uh, a book I wrote with one of my colleagues uh, a few years back. This is optional reading, uh, thanks to the wonders of modern publishing technology. If you buy a copy of this book, I make a grand total of $1. There are currently 62 of you registered in this course. So if I twist all of your arms and force you to buy my textbook, I will make a grand total of $62. So. Not too much of a financial incentive for me to do so. I would love it if you read our book, but it is, it is optional. Okay, um, I tape each one uh, of the lectures, and when I get back to my office, I upload that lecture to YouTube, and then I put the link uh, into the schedule. For, so if for some reason you can't come to class, you can watch the lecture for today, later today, and you can use it for the quiz, which is due tonight. And I'll talk about quizzes uh, in a moment. Um, I was on sabbatical last year, so I didn't teach this course. Last time I taught this course was two years ago. You can go and see all the lectures from uh, last year. So if you are not tired of my voice, uh, you can go back and actually hear me re-describe the concepts from years past as well. So hopefully we have everything covered there. OK. Um, I post online versions uh, of the lecture slides on the schedule before class. So um, what I suggest is you print it out, bring it to class, and annotate it uh, the old-fashioned way as we go. Um, what you will find is that your copy of the slides is an incomplete version of the ones that I project up here. When you see that difference, and I'll highlight that difference by putting a red box up on the screen here. That's just a prod to remind you to annotate the slides as we go. It's an old fashioned method, but it seems to be the best way for you to absorb the material from the, the course. That's one option. The other option is just to come to class and listen. As I mentioned, the video lectures, I put them online after class. So if you want, later today, you can go and watch the video lecture and annotate the slides electronically or on paper, however you, you like. That's, that's fine, too. You don't necessarily have to print out lecture slides and bring them to class, but I do recommend that. 
Okay, um, as I mentioned, there are uh, quizzes on lecture day. So every day we have a lecture. There is a quiz due at 11.59 that night. So you have a quiz due tonight at 11.59 p.m. When I get back to my office, I will post the quiz uh, on Blackboard. So you should be able to find it there a couple hours after class. It's very short. There's usually two or three multiple choice questions. If you came to class and you did the reading, you should be able to do this quiz in about four minutes time. It's very, very quick. Again, it's just there as a prod to make sure that you're keeping up with the lecture material uh, as, we, as we go. Okay, any questions about that before we carry on? So far, so good. I forgot to mention, I love my lectures to be interactive, so please feel free to stop me and ask questions uh, as we go. That's perfectly fine. No such thing as a stupid question. Okay, uh, useful software. This is a programming intensive course. You're gonna be developing a lot of Python code around your Leap Motion device in the next uh, 10 weeks. Um, it's all, as I mentioned, in Python. Um, if you're not familiar with Python or you're a little bit rusty, I would suggest you take the time now before the semester gets busy to work your way through an online Python tutorial. Never hurts to brush up uh, your skills. I recommend the one on Codecademy, but there's dozens of online programming tutorials out there. Whatever works for you is, is fine. Yes? What version of Python are you using? We are going to be using, uh, for, for most of you, you're going to be using Python 2.7, which is the Python that's compatible with Leap Motion. When I taught this course two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, that was the standard. I realized it is no longer the standard. So for some of you, again, this might be a little bit painful, but you may have to install Python 2.7. My apologies for that. That's the version of Python that talks to Leap Motion and vice versa. Okay. Um, we're also going to be making extensive use of the following four Python packages. How many of you have seen or used some of these packages before? Okay, that's pretty good. Um, so again, you might want to uh, use the uh, quiet time at the beginning of the semester to get everything installed. So if you don't have NumPy, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn, and Pygame installed for Python 2.7, you might want to do so now. Um, for uh, this week, we're only going to be using matplotlib. Uh, in weeks two, three, and four, we're going to uh, also be using NumPy and scikit-learn. Pygame is kind of optional. Um, some students have found that that's more useful for them later in the semester as a replacement for matplotlib. So you can play around with Pygame if you want. Um, but again, we're going to just be using matplotlib this week. Okay. Grades. Uh, participation, 5% uh, of your course is participation. Why is that? Because I have found in the past that students that tend to do well in my course tend to miss relatively few classes. So here's some data. This is data from actually my CS206 class, so not this class, but I'm pretty sure there's a pretty similar pattern for this class. It's from the last four times I taught CS206. Each dot here represents a student. We have 164 students. And you can probably see there's a pretty clear pattern here. The more often you come to class, the better you tend to do in my course. There you go. OK. OK, so participation. Um, what I expect is not perfect attendance. Um, I expect you to miss up to and possibly including three courses, uh, classes. If you find that you're missing more than three classes, come and let me know and let's, let's talk about it. Uh, at the beginning of every class, I will pass around an attendance sheet. Just write your name on it, pass it along to the next person, and I'll collect it at the end of the class. Uh, daily quizzes, as I mentioned, there's one quiz after every class. We have about 30 classes, but not exactly. So each individual quiz works out to about 1%. Not quite 1%, but somewhere, somewhere around there. So any one quiz, not that important, but clearly they, they start to add up. So do make sure you stay on top uh, of the quizzes. As you can see from the grade breakdown here, the bulk of the assessment is on these uh, weekly programming assignments where you're building code around the Leap Motion device. 
These weekly uh, programming projects are cumulative. So if for some reason you don't complete the programming project for one week, you have to complete it in order to complete the next one. So you definitely don't want to fall behind with the programming projects. Okay. Um, they will take you through the weekly deliverables or the weekly projects will take you through uh, the first 10 weeks of the course. And then you have these three written reports. And these are written reports on how you're taking your code base that you developed over the first 10 weeks and how you're expanding it for your final project, which is up to you to decide what that is. And again, we'll talk about the final projects in a moment. But you're keeping us up to date on how you're actually doing with that. Um, and I'll use your first written report to replace the lowest grade out of your 10 weekly deliverables. So if you fall off the treadmill at some point, there's an opportunity for you to make it back again. Okay, um, then at the exam period, uh, you're going to be presenting your final project in class. Um, this is always a lot of fun, very chaotic, and somewhat challenging. As I mentioned, we have 62 students in this class and we have slightly less than three hours for our exam period, which works out to about two minutes or two minutes and 30 seconds for each student. For those of you that have taken my robotics course, you've been through this process before. We'll talk about it uh, when we get a little bit closer to it. But you're basically gonna be presenting very briefly and orally your final project, and you'll also be submitting a final written report describing your, your final project. Okay. As you can see, there's no midterm and no final exam for this, for this course. Most of it is practice and traditional assessment is bundled up in the, the quizzes here. Any questions about grades and grading? No? Okay. Um, so there may be some students here that are taking this course for graduate credit. Can I see the grad students that are here? Just a few of you, okay. I will meet with you individually to talk about the additional uh, work you'll be doing for this, this course. Okay, what are your responsibilities in this course? Uh, late policy, um, if you fail to take the quiz today and you take the quiz online tomorrow, it will be docked 25%. If you take it on Thursday, it will be docked 50%. After that, you don't need to submit it. Okay. Um, you are welcome to cooperate, but I want each of you to work individually on these coding assignments. Of course, you could get together in a group and do them together, but you need to understand this code base that you're going to be developing over the first 10 weeks. You need to understand it all the way to the ground because you're going to be changing it in the final three or four weeks of the course to do your final project. So if you work together and you borrow someone else's code, when you get to do your final project, it's going to be very hard to modify the code base because you don't understand it. So I suggest you can cooperate to try and understand things, but sit down and work your way through implementing the code on your own so you really understand it all the way down to the ground. Yes? Uh, so super far ahead, before a final yep. project, would yep. you choose our own partners, or is that going to be uh, you, you won't have partners for the final project. It's still, it's still individual. What you are going to be doing, however, is grabbing a friend who's going to test your code. They're going to, they're going to serve as your guinea pig or your, your users for user testing. But you'll be implementing things on your own. So there'll be 62 final projects at the end. Great. Okay. We already talked about, uh, we already talked about um, participation. Um, if there's anyone who has exceptional needs, come and see me and we can, we can talk about that. Okay, any questions about the syllabus? Again, you can find it from Blackboard. Let's switch over and have a look at the schedule now. Um, so please do get in the habit of checking out the schedule before, uh, before you come to class. So here's today. Um, if you click on the link here, that'll take you to the slides uh, for today. There's the required reading for today, which is chapter one uh, from the textbook. And then from time to time, I throw up some optional reading. Uh, today, it's the Bad Designs website. Uh, it's a lot of fun to read. You don't have to read all of it. It's pretty extensive. As I mentioned, we're gonna spend a fair bit of time in this class talking about design. It's very easy when you're creating interactive software to design it poorly so that one out of 10 users can use it well. There's some great examples on the Bad Designs web, uh, website, not just of code, but of 
anything that was designed poorly. Okay, as I mentioned, you're going to be implementing uh, these 10 deliverables that will help you build your code base for the final project. There's the link that points to deliverable one. So if you click on this link here, it'll take you to a PDF, which will walk you through step-by-step uh, step all the instructions about how to implement this particular part of the code base. We'll come back to deliverable one uh, in a moment. And you can see that uh, deliverable one is due next Monday at 11.59. PM. So each deliverable is assigned Tuesday morning and is due the following uh, Monday night. And then the following Tuesday morning, I will talk you through the next deliverable. Okay. Um, pay attention to the timing here. So uh, Monday, the deliverable one is due, but neither Jack nor I have office hours on Monday. So if you leave the deliverable until the final day, you're on your own. So I suggest you start early. If you get stuck, consult your, your peers in this course, consult Jack, consult me, and we'll get, we'll get through this. Okay. Uh, I've already put up the lecture notes for uh, next Thursday. I think we probably won't get through all of today's lecture notes, but I put them up there just in case. There's the reading for next Thursday if you want to read ahead. Question. I'm just curious, how yeah. schedule if you can't make it to my office hours or Jack, send me an email and I have free slots in my schedule. We can definitely find a time for you, for you to meet. No problem. Yes. Sorry, uh, just to be clear, the, yes. the required reading on that schedule is due for like the class after or is under. Right? The required reading is due for this class. Okay. So, so that's a good point. So the quiz that you're going to take tonight, I will draw the material for that quiz from the lecture notes. <laughs> We're probably not going to get through many lecture notes today. Uh, so there probably won't be much material to draw it from. And or the question may also be drawn from this reading. So do the reading before class or this afternoon and then take, take the quiz. Okay. Obviously this is all online, so it's open book. Um, if you want to do the reading while you're taking the quiz, that's, that's fine too. Right? Again, the quizzes are just there to make sure that you keep up with the lecture material and the reading. Okay. Uh, right, so deliverable one is due next Monday. We'll talk about deliverable one in a moment. And then next Tuesday, I will assign deliverable two, and on we go. The reason why you already have homework in this class, the reason why I'm assigning deliverable one today, is some of you may not be sure whether this course is right for you. Um, so get started on deliverable one right away. If you find deliverable one is somewhat overly challenging for you, then HCI might not be the class for you, and if you're a junior, you're free to take the course next year. As I mentioned, it's coding intensive. You're gonna do a fair bit of coding between today and next Monday. Deliverable one is representative, I think, of the sort of level of work that's expected in each of the deliverables. So deliverable one it has two purposes, one to get you started, but also for you to figure out whether this course is right for you. So yet another reason to get started on it soon rather than, than next Monday. Okay, so let's just take a step back for a moment. Um, you can have a look through the schedule, which I think helps to uh, reinforce the structure of this course. As you scroll through, you'll notice that there are one, two, three, four, five major themes uh, in the course. The first modular theme here is going to be sort of an overview of what HCI is and what HCI uh, isn't. We're going to talk a little bit about what makes HCI special. Um, the next longer theme here is going to be on design. So in HCI, we tend to spend a lot of time in design up front before we actually start writing code. And a big part of that design process is figuring out what about people matters. So before Leap Motion was ever created, hopefully, the designer sat down and thought, what matters here? Let's have a look at the human hand. Not everybody has five fingers. Oh, look at that. I have a ring and a watch on my hand. I wonder if that's going to matter for the system we're thinking about designing. Right? So how to actually formalize that process is extremely important. If you skip the design process and you start writing code and you throw it out there in the world and people start interacting with your code, things, especially nowadays, can go spectacularly wrong. And there's been a few examples of that 
in the popular media in just the last few weeks. Right? So we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how do we approach building technology in which a lot of people are going to interact with it before we actually start creating it. Okay, in order to do that design, we have to think not just about the tech, but about people. People are pretty complicated, um, so we're going to spend just four lectures sort of doing a crash course in cognitive psychology, so sort of the aspects of human behavior that are important for HCI. Of course, we could spend three, three courses or 30 courses on just this, this subject, so it's going to be necessar a necessarily shallow treatment of human uh, behavior. And we will then, in the fourth uh, section of the course, start to look outward. So we'll start by looking at traditional code that you write, might write on your machine, and maybe you're the only person that ever uses it. Moving outward to code that might be used by lots of people. So then start to broaden our concept of tech, tech by thinking about all the different ways in which people might interact with your, your system. So for most of you, you're going to be interacting with this device in a way that you never have before, which is waving your hand over the device. This is not a mouse. It's not a keyboard. It's not, it is a camera, but not, not, not a webcam. So that brings in other issues to think about. Um, and then we'll keep moving outward and start to look at more and more exotic technologies. And those technologies interact with us in lots of different ways, in lots of different settings. That's looking outward. And we'll finish the course with three lectures on what I'm somewhat calling tongue-in-cheek looking inward, right? So building virtual worlds in which people are sort of entering those virtual worlds rather than the inverse, which is deploying technology out here in the physical world. Okay. Any questions about the schedule? Yes? Is our deliverable due a day later because of the holiday or not? It is not due a day later before the holiday, yes. So next Monday is a holiday. Good idea to finish deliverable one before Labor Day weekend so that you can enjoy it. Okay. Okay, so that's the schedule. Let's now talk about deliverable one. Uh, as I've mentioned several times by now, um, you're going to be developing code for Leap Motion. And when you finish deliverable one, this is a visualization of the code base that you're going to have. You're going to turn on your Leap Motion device. You are going to wave your hand over the device. The device detects your hand, takes the raw pixel values, turns it into XYZ coordinates. You are then going to write some Python code that grabs those coordinates from the device. And you're then going to take those coordinates and use them to update a drawing window. And we're going to do something very simple, which is use just the x, y coordinate of the tip of your index finger. And we're going to use those x and y coordinates to set the position of a dot. And if you do this correctly, you will get the following. So now you have a continuous feedback loop where you are able to move this dot around the screen on your machine. You are obviously watching the screen and seeing the dot move, and how the dot moves is going to influence how you move your hand. So you're going to have a, a very, very small piece of Python code, which is going to have at the top of it a while true statement. This is a loop that's going to run forever, and every pass through this loop, this is going to happen. We have a human that is interacting with a computer, HCI. Right? Pretty simple. Once you have this at the end of deliverable one, deliverables two through nine, are, uh, two through ten, are going to be complicating and enriching this feedback loop. But at the lowest level, you're always going to have this real time feedback loop. This loop itself is going to look more and more complicated as you go. So a good rule of thumb as you're implementing these 10 deliverables is from time to time to close your eyes and make sure that you can recall wherever you are the deliverable what this feedback loop looks like and what's, what's happening. Yeah. So if you get lost, that, that should be able to reorient you. Okay. 
Uh, at the top here, you'll notice there's just a very uh, brief description of what you're going to be doing. And then below that are eight pages of, let's see here, 32 steps. So it's pretty involved. Again, best to get started as soon as possible. Okay, let's go back to the summary at the top. Um, the first thing you're going to do is install the Leap Motion uh, software and run the visualizer demo like I showed you before. Um, so you are actually going to capture a very short, you're going to capture a very short video like this and also upload it to YouTube. So what you're going to be submitting in this course, or in, sorry, what you're going to be submitting in each deliverable is a See if I can highlight this. You're going to be submitting for each deliverable a YouTube playlist. And inside that playlist is going to be a series of videos. And each video is going to be you demonstrating to Jack, the TA, that you've successfully implemented that part of the deliverable. So in deliverable one, you're going to be submitting three videos. The first one is that you've successfully installed Leap Motion and that you can get the visualizer demo to run. The next video is going to be you demonstrating that you've successfully installed Matplotlib. And Matplotlib is a drawing package for uh, Python. So you've got Leap Motion working, you've written some separate Python code that randomly moves this dot, and you can probably imagine where I'm going from here. The third video you're going you're gonna to make shows that you've been able to successfully integrate these two pieces. Right? You now have Leap Motion talking to Matplotlib. In this course, you're never going to be submitting any code. Um, you may not know why your code is crashing. You may not know where the bug is. Neither does Jack and neither do I. Right? So one of the things you cannot expect from us is to help us debug your code. We can help you with pretty much everything else, but you're a junior or senior now or a grad student. You can surely debug your own, your own code. Easier said than done, right? Okay. okay. So uh, you shoot these three videos, upload them to YouTube, stitch them together in a playlist, and very importantly, make sure that the settings on all the videos and the playlist is set to public so Jack can watch the videos and grade your deliverable. When you're done, uh, when you're done the deliverable, you'll come back to Blackboard and in Course Materials, in Course Materials, uh, there's the schedule. You'll also see there's a folder for deliverables. And at the moment, there's just deliverable one in there. If you click on uh, deliverable one, there's the PDF instructions that we just looked at. When you go to submit, you do write submission, and then you copy and paste just the URL that points to your YouTube playlist. It's the only thing you're ever submitting in this class are images or videos that demonstrate successful implementation of X, whatever X happens to be. Make sense? Straightforward? Okay, great. Let's come back to deliverable uh, one. Um, although the code itself is relatively simple in deliverable one, again, I'd like you to get started as soon as possible because one of the biggest challenges in this first week is installation issues. How many of you are, have a Mac? How many of you have a Windows machine? How many of you are using Windows on that Windows machine? How many of you are using Linux? Okay, one brave soul there. Okay, two brave souls, excellent. Okay, so we have different platforms, different operating systems. Unfortunately, some of those platform and OS combinations play better with Leap Motion than others. So for hopefully the vast majority of this course, it will take you all of about five minutes to download, install, and run Leap Motion, and import the Leap Motion library into your Python code. It should take about five minutes. Some of you might get through this deliverable and wonder what the big deal is. It seemed relatively straightforward. Unfortunately, for a minority of you, installation is gonna take a little bit more than five minutes. 
And unfortunately, for a very small fraction of you, it's going to take much more than five minutes. Unfortunately, I don't know which of you that is. Depends on the combination of your platform and operating system. So please get started as soon as possible. Um, and if you come up against installation problems, be sure to contact Jack and myself, and we'll get you. We'll get you through this. Um, as you're filling out, uh, as you're as you're working your way through the deliverable. Let's see if I can find this easily in here. Uh, I can't uh, I can't find it at the moment, but somewhere in here there is a link to a spreadsheet at the top of the assign uh, top of the deliverable, which will ask you to type into the spreadsheet your uh, your platform and your operating system, and then after you've got Leap Motion up and running and working, there'll be a link that'll take you back to the spreadsheet, and you just check off uh, an element next to your name. So we'll be able to see all the platforms and OSs that you're using in this course and we'll be able to pretty rapidly identify the combinations where people are having problems. So please do fill out that spreadsheet. That will help us help you if you're having installation issues. OK, any questions about that? OK. OK, I think that is more or less most of the logistics of the course. As I mentioned, we just talked about the syllabus and schedule. So let's start to talk a little bit about what HCI actually is. As I mentioned, this, uh, this course is going to be quite a bit different from a lot of the CS courses uh, you've seen. One of the reasons why it's quite different is that I can't teach you how to create good code for existing devices. What we're really focusing on in this course is thinking about designing code or interfaces for the devices to come. Right? Um, I've been teaching this course for about 10 years when I, uh, I'm sorry, 11 years. When I first taught this course at the beginning, I said, imagine in the future when we have a lot of devices where instead of using a keyboard, you can just touch the screen and interact with the computer or the device just through touch. 11 years ago, for everyone in that course, that was almost sci-fi. It was on the horizon, but it wasn't here now. Some of you are laughing. It's amazing how much can change in 11 years or less, right? So every year there are these new interesting technologies uh, that are arriving on the market. And one of the things that makes these technologies interesting is that they interact with people and people interact with those technologies in ways that we never have uh, before. You should be able to recognize this one by now. What's this one? Google Glass. Um, this has actually been around for a few years now. Why are none of you wearing Google Glasses today? <laughs> Pretty much everyone in this class I'm imagining has one of these, or a version of that. No one has Google Glass, why not? It's not user friendly. It's not user friendly, why is it not user friendly? The controls aren't intuitive. The controls aren't intuitive. They're actually not too bad, in my opinion. It's actually not that they're not user friendly. They're friendly for the user, the person that's wearing the glasses. People aren't friendly to the users. People aren't friendly to the users, right? I'm wearing Google Glass and I'm looking at you. I'm recording you and everything you say and every facial expression you make, right? I'm not sure whether Google thought about this beforehand, but there are serious privacy, social privacy issues that people have with Google Glass. It works perfectly fine, all the software perfectly debugged, everything works well. Maybe not user friendly for everyone, but for most people it's relatively intuitive when you put it on how to use it. They did not think about acceptability. And we're gonna talk about that. Acceptability is a very different, very different from usability, which is how easy it is to use something. Assuming you deploy a technology out there into society, will society accept it? And so far, at least with the case of Google Glass, absolutely not. OK, how about this one? The ear implants for deaf people? Yeah, it's a cochlear implant. I don't know if anyone here actually has one. We'll talk about this towards the end of the course. It's not a hearing aid. It's an implant on the inside, uh, on the inside of your skull that talks directly with your cochlea. So cyborgs are a reality, it already exists. This is a pretty interesting 
form of human-computer interaction, where the human is interacting with a computer that is not on the skin like a wearable, it is under the skin, or in this case, under the, the skull. Very interesting. Here's some robotic technology. Um, you've probably, probably all seen 3D printed uh, prosthetic arms and legs, where humans are starting to interact with technology or computers in ways that are very different from the way we used to interact with computers back in the day. So what we're going to try and do in this course is really maybe use these existing technologies to think about, to think carefully about human-computer interaction. But what I hope you take away from this course, for those of you that go and work in industry, is to apply those ideas to technologies that aren't even on this slide yet. Right? There's probably even more exotic technologies that are going to come down the pipeline. They're going to require you to think very carefully about how people should and how people will want to interact with those technologies. Makes things challenging because those technologies don't exist yet, but I want you to sort of keep that in the back of your, your mind. Okay, we already talked about Blackboard. Um, a little bit more about expectations, um, what Jack and I can expect from you. Feedback, please don't hesitate to ask questions or supply comments as we go through lecture, common sense, as I already mentioned, regular but not perfect uh, attendance. You're going to work pretty hard in this course. Some of the deliverables take a fair bit of time to implement. Set aside uh, enough time to get them done. I expect you to keep up with the class homework assignments. Um, there'll be lots of opportunity for you to be creative when you take the code base and turn it into a final project in the last uh, part of the course. And we expect uh, self-learning. So we, Jack, neither Jack nor I are here to teach you Python. There's this awesome thing called the internet. You can Google it and it will teach you how to write Python code. Okay, positive attitude when you're working with me, Jack and fellow students goes without saying. I've already mentioned this, what you cannot expect from Jack and I is to answer why is my program uh, crashing we are not here to help you learn a programming language. We are, I should actually uh, modify this one here. We will help you install uh, Leap Motion to the best of our ability. Um, Jack has a PC. I am a Windows, uh, sorry, I'm a, a Mac person. So we may or may not have the same platform OS combination that you do, but we will do our best to help you if you're having a hard time getting Leap Motion up and, up and running. Okay. Okay, um, what you can't expect from me, um, I'm here to sort of help with general programming questions. We're gonna make use of Python dictionaries. Again, if you don't know what a Python dictionary is, you can easily Google it. But I'm happy to talk about sort of the, con the concepts and why we might be using Python dictionaries in deliverable four or five, I forget which one it is. I can help with that. Okay, um, but again, we expect you've sort of done your homework online beforehand. Um, definitely, I'm here to help with conceptual issues, so we're going to talk about a lot of relatively abstract concepts like embodied cognition, and you're going to have an opportunity to ground some of those concepts in actual code and actual hardware, but again, I'm happy to talk about conceptual issues. Um, if you're working with others and there's a problem there, please do come and see Jack and I, and we can help with that. Please ask for clarification. I, I'm, much, I'm much happier to take questions up front. Um, if you ask a question about a deliverable that I think will be relevant to the class, I'll broadcast it back out on Blackboard or talk about it at the beginning of, of class. What you can definitely expect from me is going to be an emphasis, at least on the classroom, on concepts rather than specific tools. So we've used Leap Motion for the last few years. We'll probably use it maybe for another year, another two years. And then there will probably be something that replaces Leap Motion. We'll be using something else. So concepts change slowly, but tools change relatively quickly, right? So we're really, I'm not trying to teach you how to use Leap Motion. I'm trying to teach you how to think about the HCI concepts through grounding them in a specific temporary technology, which in this case is Leap Motion. Okay, so uh, let's move on again to some more interesting material. So why are you here? Why is there a course uh, on HCI? There's many reasons. Let's start with some of the obvious ones. Um, there's some pretty cool jobs that are out there at the moment in HCI. There are a lot of coding jobs out there. Uh, some of them are more interesting than others. 
a lot of the very routine coding jobs that have to do with routine database and web, uh, web, uh, web design, a lot of those jobs are being outsourced. U.S. companies that are looking to hire software engineers are typically looking to hire people that are good coders, that have a good uh, solid grounding in software engineering, but are also able to think about the front end carefully. So uh, when you graduate and you go out in industry or you go out uh, for job interviews, you will often find a lot of those job interviews is they will test you on your software engineering skills, and then they will say, uh, we developed this device here at Leap Motion called the Leap Motion device. And imagine you have a hundred people that use the device. Some people may have a harder time using it than others. Why? That's an HCI question, right? For the job applicants that are good coders and can answer those kinds of questions well, those are the ones that tend to get the interesting jobs where you're not just doing routine code development. You're working on interface design, designing technology that in which that's going to touch people, that, that's actually front-facing and people are interacting with. It's an interesting combination of skills and it's rare and companies know that. That's, that's what they're looking for. This slide is over 10 years old, so take the salary there with a grain of salt. Um, 10 years ago, CNN Money thought that software engineering was the best job in the world. I imagine they probably have some bias, but anyways, there you go. Um, my job is second, so go out and become a software engineer and you can have a better job than I do. Okay. Um, why else might you want to take HCI? As I mentioned, there's some pretty cool jobs here. This is a screenshot of the front page of the New York Times uh, two years ago. And on the front page of the New York Times on that day, there was a the lead article also had an interactive a graphic associated with it, which actually now that I think about it, this particular article might be of interest to you guys. The author uh, of this article, Interactive uh, Graphic, Nick Strayer, uh, took this course, I think in 2014. So um, I'll have to check with Nick, but he was here, took the course, uh, went out, uh, and I think he's now a grad student, but he also did some part-time work for the New York Times. And his graphic that he created ended up on the front page of the New York Times. So there are some interesting jobs out there in HCI. Okay, part two, there's again lots of reasons why you might want to take HCI. As I mentioned, a lot of the code you're going to be de developing in this course or in HCI is front facing, right? It's going to be used by a lot of people. And if people are going to be using it, people um, or humans, we're primarily visual creatures. We have lots of sense organs, but the one that we rely on most of the time is vision. So a lot of the design we're going to talk about in this course is visual design. You all know about the big data revolution. We're all drowning in data. How do we take that mass of data that's out there? And how do we present the patterns that are in the data to users? There's a data science course here at UVM. That's about how to find the patterns in the data. It's also a machine learning course. We'll talk about that a little bit. So there's set, sort of separate problems here. Given a huge data set, how do you find patterns in the data? And then once you find them, how do you present them so that people can absorb those patterns? Right? You can't train a deep neural network to recognize patterns and then show somebody the deep learner. Right? That doesn't mean anything to them. You need to translate results somehow in a way that's digestible, usually by a very broad audience. Right? We're going to use Leap Motion as one example technology in this class. The other example technology we're going to use is a website called Gapminder. Has anybody seen Gapminder before? A couple people, but not many. Great. OK. Um, as you can probably guess from this picture, this is a screenshot from Gapminder. Gapminder is about trying to present uh, human health and human wealth data. Um, in this particular screenshot here, I've taken one wealth indica indicator here, which is gross national product, how much people tend to make salary-wise, more or less average for that country, a wealth indicator on the horizontal axis, and a <coughs> health indicator on the vertical axis, if you live in a given country, how long on average can you expect to live? Okay. You'll notice there's a lot of data that's presented here, and with a few exceptions, there's no text explanation that this thing represents this. So there are a large number of visual features here, 
like circles, opacity, transparency, color, size, those are all visual features that aren't explained with text on the screen. The reason they're not is because the Gapminder designers spent a lot of time thinking about how to present a lot of data to a very wide audience. And the evidence that they did it well is that you should be able to figure out what these different visual uh, features represent without having to read some manual or some pop-up explaining what it is. So let's see whether you can. What do the circles represent? Countries in different years, right? So you can see this particular country here, China, and you can see that it's represented in different years. How did you know that it's representing different years? Sorry? There are dates. There's dates, right? So we've got a date back here. We can see that there's multiple circles. They all correspond to China, right? So you can put all that together and figure out that it's showing you a trajectory over time. What, tra what is that trajectory telling you? It's showing the income changes uh, depending on like, the life expectancy over time. Uh, I guess it's showing how both those things are changing over time. How both those things are changing over time. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Let's dig down a little bit. So you've got a bunch of these circles. And in the case of China, we have a bunch of these circles that are overlaid on top of one another. What does that mean? Some of the China circles are occluded, meaning they're behind other ones. And the one in the upper right is closest, quote unquote, to you. What does that mean? I mean, just the most recent data set. How did you know that? Intuitively. Intuitively. You knew that intuitively from this. What this whole trajectory here is what's known as a visual metaphor. So this circle, which is representing particular data about China at a particular time, is closer to you because it's sitting on top of these other circles, and because these circles are occluded, they're further from you. Humans are primarily visual creatures, and I can see some of you clearly because you're close to me, and others of you that are further away are partially occluded. You've all had that experience for however long you've been alive, right? It's just so obvious you don't even think about it. So that must mean that circles that are closer to you are also closer to you in time. So there's a little bit of a cheat here because this 1975 is probably telling you that that circle in the back there is the data from 1975. But even if we erased this piece and I told you that this was a trajectory of health and wealth data for China over time, you'd probably be able to guess that this is the most recent data and this is the oldest data. Okay? It's visually closer to you and it's metaphoric, therefore it must be metaphorically closer to us in time. It's more recent than the other data. Right? All of that there is, for most of us, subliminal. You don't even realize it's happening, but it leads you to say something like, well, it's kind of intuitive. Right? Imagine that this circle represented 1975 and that circle in the back represented 2004. You'd probably be pretty frustrated once you realize that was the case. You may not be able to articulate it unless you're an expert in HCI. You realize that they've broken the metaphor. The thing that visually looks closer to you is metaphorically furthest from you in time. There's a dissonance there, right? Those things don't match up. We'll talk about visual metaphors when we get to the design part of this, this course. What, uh, what do the colors represent? The countries. And that you can kind of see there's a little graphic there on the top right. What does the size of the circle represent? Well, I would assume populations. How did you know that? Size equals population. It doesn't uh, say it anywhere there. Well, you know that China has one of the largest populations in the world, and the United States is like third or fourth. Sure, right? You can, at you can kind of figure it out, right? So size is going to probably represent population. Do you think bigger circles represent bigger countries, or bigger circles represent smaller countries? It's the former, right? Obviously. Imagine someone picked the opposite. You'd be extremely confused because they have violated another visual metaphor, right? Doesn't, doesn't make sense. You're laughing because it seems so obvious. You'd be amazed how often people miss those kinds of things. Right? What does opacity and transparency represent here? Uh, shows that they're not the main focus and that they're not the 
That's right. So if you go and play around with Gapminder, and I suggest you do, it's interactive. So in this case, I've clicked on China and the United States and then dragged this slider bar back and forth, which paints these trajectories over time. So by moving that sliding bar, I can see not only how health and wealth in China and the United States have changed, but how those two indicators have changed relative from one country to the, the other. So Gapminder is not just a passive picture that we're looking at, we are at the moment, it's an interactive thing that you interact with. There's a human that can interact with this computer, this website, and through that interaction you can test various hypotheses about health and wealth in various countries. It, how is China and the United States changing relative to one another? That's a question I might bring to the website and test it by interacting with the website in some way. I might ask whether Leap Motion has a harder time with rings than without, and I can test that hypothesis by doing this, and then by doing this and watching the visualizer demo to see how it does. Okay, I think that's a good place to pause. Um, before you wrap up here, what we're gonna do uh, now is we're gonna form two lines. Doesn't matter which one. One over there, one over there. First person in the line, take a Leap Motion device, note the number on that device, and write it into the spreadsheet and sign it out. Once you have a device and you've signed your name in, you're free to go and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.